In 2014, the United States Navy decided it was time to decommission one of their old frigate ships, and so they sent it to a dock to be broken down for scrap. In order for workers to actually be able to access the underside of the ship and actually begin to break it down, they would need to dry dock the ship, which meant the ship would basically drive into this special locking corral where the doors would shut behind it, the water would drain out from underneath, and the ship would be left resting on these huge wooden blocks that elevated it off the ground. And with no water in there, workers were able to get underneath the hull and could access every part of the ship without obstruction. It's important to note for this story that when a ship is in dry dock, there is only one way on or off. It's this ramp called a gangway that leads from the dock onto the deck of the ship. Besides that, there is nowhere else for you to get on this ship. And if for some reason you really wanted to get on and couldn't use the gangway, you could in theory try to run and leap from the dock to the ship. There's a pretty significant gap there all the way around, but you could try the jump. But if you weren't successful at grabbing onto the ship, you would fall multiple stories, probably to your death, because there's no water in the dry dock. So this old frigate ship that was being decommissioned was officially dry docked in July of 2014. The first group of people that went on board the ship to begin dismantling it were military personnel. They were in charge of removing all of the sensitive equipment before civilians were allowed to go on board. The military personnel begin to wrap up and it's getting late in the day and they tell the foreman who's in charge of all of the civilian workers that are going to be going on and finishing this decommissioning of the ship. They go to the foreman and they say, hey, we're done. We're wrapped up for the night. Your workers are good to go. They can get on here tomorrow. The foreman would send a message to his boss that night, letting him know that they were on track to start work the next day. The boss would respond and say, hey, can you go on there tonight and take pictures of all the different workstations so we know how many people that we need to place in different segments of this big ship. So the foreman walks onto the ship and proceeds to take hundreds of pictures all over the inside of the ship. Now, the ship itself was pitch black inside. There was no electricity and it was nighttime. So he had a flashlight the whole time, but whenever he took a picture, he would turn his flashlight off and then use the flash on his camera before going back to his actual flashlight. So all night he's going room to room taking all these pictures and at some point he realizes he's photographed everything he needs to. So he leaves, he goes back to his office, he uploads the pictures and he sends them to his boss. His boss wrote back almost immediately and just said, Who's the guy with the ax? Now, the foreman has no idea what he's talking about. He was just in the ship by himself for a couple of hours and didn't see anyone. So he reads the email again to make sure he read it correctly, and he sees that his boss has actually attached the picture he is referring to. Here is this guy clearly clutching an ax in a hallway that he was just in. And even creepier is the foreman is looking at where this picture was taken, and it was relatively early on in his photo shoot. And he had walked past the exact area where this guy is poking his head out of, which which means the whole time he was down there, this guy with an ax was there with him. They review the security footage of a camera that was aimed directly at the ramp, the one entrance in and out of the ship. And from the time the foreman left, no one else left. So they don't know how he got on or how he got off without being detected, but somehow he did. In 2014, Alan Ruby was a 19-year-old freshman studying political science at the University of Oklahoma. Despite being relatively modest and soft-spoken in person on social media, he projected this lifestyle of wealth and grandeur. He'd oftentimes post pictures of exotic sports cars and expensive watches and clothes, and he would travel the world to Paris, London, New York City, and take all these pictures showing off this incredible life he had. He really wanted people to believe that he was this fabulously well Healthy, successful guy. Alan was only able to project this phony lifestyle on social media because he was spending his father's money. His father was a successful businessman who was also the publisher of a newspaper that was quite successful and so Alan would just spend his money and then even after his father would give him money Alan would steal his credit card and additionally rack up thousands of dollars of credit card debt. But as media began to shift away from print media to almost all digital, a lot of newspapers began to fail because they weren't able to transition to digital. And his father's newspaper was not making that transition 
transition very well and they were losing money left and right. And so Alan's father told everybody in his family with a focus on Alan that we all need to cut back on our spending because money's tight right now and it's unclear if it's gonna turn around. So we gotta be careful with how much money we do have. Alan acted like he was gonna cut back on his lavish lifestyle, but in reality, he wasn't going to. He was totally addicted to spending money and giving off this vibe that he was so wealthy and successful. And so around this time, Alan steals his grandmother's credit card and secretly leaves the country and goes to Paris to have this vacation on his own. He's taking these pictures in front of the Eiffel Tower and he's spending all this money. And his father finds out that he's stolen this credit card and he's furious. And instead of waiting for Alan to come home and saying, don't do that again, he decides he's gonna send him a message that he's gonna remember. And he calls the police. Alan gets charged with theft, he pleads guilty, and he has to go before a judge who sees that he has no criminal record. So he kind of goes easy on him. And he says that you need to pay back all the money you spent to your grandmother and you need to go to an addiction program to try to break this habit of yours, to stop spending all this money. After Alan leaves court, his father felt like he finally got the message. It seemed like it had finally gotten through to him that this was a really big problem, and he felt like he had made the right decision in calling the police. But in reality, Alan hadn't changed at all. As soon as he got back from court, he was stealing from people outside of the family, he was taking loans from loan sharks, all of this just to keep up with his phony appearance he portrayed on social media. On October 9th, 2014, Alan owed $3,000 to a particular loan shark and had no way of paying it back. So instead of asking his parents for money, which for him would have been too embarrassing, he decides the best course of action is to kill his entire family. And so he strolls into his home and he shoots his mom dead, he shoots his sister dead, and then he waits for his dad to come home and he shoots him dead. Because his big plan is with his whole family gone, he's gonna become the sole heir to the family's estate and that will be enough money to not only pay off this $3,000 debt, but have a little leftover so he can go on vacation to Paris again. So after he's committed this horrible crime, he leaves his family where they are, he goes and takes the surveillance footage from inside the house, it was on a DVD, takes the DVD out, takes the murder weapon, leaves the house, chucks the DVD and the weapon into a lake, and proceeds to drive to Dallas, where he checks into a very fancy hotel and meets up with friends and parties the whole weekend. His friends that were with him that weekend would later tell investigators that Alan seemed totally normal. There was no red flags. There was no indication that anything was wrong. He was just laughing it up and having a great time that whole weekend. The following Monday, when Alan's father doesn't show up for work, the police are notified. They go to the house and they find the Ruby family. When police went out and got Alan and brought him back to the station to chat with him and tell him what happened and see if he knew anything, his sad reaction to his whole family now being deceased was apparently so insincere that officers almost immediately assumed that he was probably the guy that did it. Ultimately, Alan would confess and the prosecutor wanted to push for the death penalty, but Alan's remaining living family members actually said, don't do the death penalty. We don't wanna risk that not happening. We wanna see justice served right now. Can we create a plea agreement where he gets life in jail, but there's absolutely no way for him to get paroled, no matter how good his behavior is, no matter how old he is, no matter what, he can't ever get out of jail. And so they did, they created that plea agreement. They gave it to Alan to sign, he signs it. And as they're walking out of the courtroom, his last remaining family members disown him and say, may God have mercy on your soul, and they leave. This is the picture that Alan uploaded to his Instagram account just hours after killing his entire family. They're all lying on the ground in his house at the time this picture is being taken. He's in this fancy hotel room with his friends and the caption reads, college wouldn't be half as fun without these two peaches. Hashtag best friends. One night in the early 1950s, a little boy named Issei Sagawa was having this dream where he and his brother were being boiled alive to be eaten. Sagawa says when he woke up, he immediately began fantasizing about what it would be like to be on the other side of that, to be on the outside with a human inside of the pot that you're boiling, that you're gonna eat. And he became totally obsessed with the idea of eating another person. By the time he was in first grade, he would find himself staring at his different classmates' legs and his mouth would be watering because he wanted to take a bite out of their leg. For three decades, he was able to suppress that urge, 
but in 1981, those cannibalistic urges would get the better of him. One summer day while he was in Tokyo, he saw this woman that he wanted to eat and he couldn't help himself. And so he began following her down the road and he saw her go into her apartment. He waited for a minute, went around back and climbed in the window. And when he got inside, she was asleep. And he hadn't thought of a plan for what he was gonna do once he was inside. And so he's just standing there thinking, well, now what do I do? How am I gonna eat her? What am I gonna do next? And as he's sitting there wondering what to do next, she wakes up and she screams and he runs away. After this breaking and entering incident, Sagawa would actually seek help. So he goes to a psychiatrist and he says, this is what I did. I snuck into her house because I wanted to eat her. And the psychiatrist would end up telling Sagawa's family that I have to label him a high risk to society because he's not just thinking about doing these things. He's already acting out these fantasies. Now, Sagawa's father was extremely wealthy and powerful. And when he heard this from the psychiatrist, he was like, no, we're not gonna do that. And so using his power and influence, he was able to kind of cover up what the psychiatrist had found and he shipped his son to Paris. Once Sagawa landed in Paris, he enrolled at the Sorbonne University and began studying literature. Despite having sought help for his cannibalistic urges, when he was in Paris, he started having that urge again and he couldn't control it. And instead of going to another therapist or psychiatrist, he begins to look for another victim. Sagawa considered himself short, weak, and ugly. And so he was actually looking for a tall, beautiful Western woman so he could absorb their energy and somehow become a bigger, better version of himself. And so he began looking around Paris for tall, beautiful women that he could potentially eat, but no one seemed like a good fit until he met Rene Hartfelt. Rene was a tall, beautiful 25-year-old Dutch student who was going to school with Sagawa at Sorbonne. In order to get close to her, Sagawa would ask his father if he would give him some money so he could hire Rene to be his personal tutor. His father gives him the money, Sagawa hires Rene, and they strike up this working relationship together. And over time, Sagawa would build trust with Rene, they would become friends, and at some point he asked Rene if she'll actually come over to his apartment, something they had not done yet. And she's sitting in his apartment with her back turned to him. He leaves the room and comes back with a rifle and he tries to fire it, but it jams. And she hasn't heard him do this. And so he's standing there and his weapon's now jammed. He hasn't fired it. And he just puts the weapon away and comes back out and acts like nothing's happened. And he's sitting there wondering, is this a sign that I'm not supposed to do this? But at the end of the night, when she finally left, he decides, you know what, I gotta go through with this. I have to eat her. And so the next night he gets her to come over again. He gets the rifle out when she's sitting with her back to him once again, except this time the rifle fires. Only for an instant, he felt really bad and thought maybe I should call an ambulance. But then he stopped himself and he said, you've waited so long for this. You gotta just go through with it. He immediately tried to take a bite out of her, but it was too difficult and unpalatable. So he calmly leaves his apartment. He goes to the store, he gets a blade. He comes back and he's able to begin removing pieces of Renee so he can eat them. Over the next two days, Sagawa would eat most of Rene, and he would take pictures of himself throughout the entire experience. When he finally felt full, he left a couple pieces still in his freezer, but put the rest of her in a suitcase and went to dump her in a lake. But as he was wheeling these heavy suitcases around town, people saw them, and it just drew a lot of suspicion. And at some point, someone must have called the police. They show up, they ask him what's inside the suitcase, they open it up, and there's Rene. When questioned about it, he just said, I killed her to eat her flesh. Sagawa awaited trial for two years in a French prison. And when he finally went in front of a French judge, when the judge read the details of this crime, it seemed so crazy and outrageous that the judge decided there's no way Sagawa can be sane. And so he was deemed insane and unfit to stand trial. He was ordered to go to a mental institution where he would be held indefinitely. Shortly after that, the French deported Sagawa back to Japan where they expected him to remain in a mental institution for the rest of his life. But that didn't happen because the French dropped his case and his documents were sealed. And when he arrived in Japan, the Japanese could not get access to his court documents. And so they did not have a case against Sagawa. And so they had to let him walk free. And so in 1986, Sagawa checked himself out of the Japanese mental institution that he had been sent to, and he's been free ever since. This is a picture of what police discovered when they opened up Sagawa's fridge inside of his apartment in Paris. This is a picture of his kitchen inside of that apartment, where you can clearly see plates and different utensils that were all used to eat Rene. This is a picture of the suitcase that Sagawa was lugging around that police showed up and asked him to open and found Rene inside of. And this is Sagawa today, 
walking freely in Tokyo, even though he blatantly killed and ate someone and openly admits to it and has even profited off of it. He's written books and he's been featured on TV shows. He's even been called in to be a food critic. But what's even more horrifying is that Sagawa openly says that before he dies, he's going to do this again. He can't live with himself unless he eats at least one more per- At 7.27 p.m. on February 9th, 2004, a woman called the Grafton County Sheriff's Department to report a car accident. A small black sedan appeared to be wedged up against a snowbank off the side of the highway near this woman's house in Woodsville, New Hampshire. The sheriff thanked her for calling and dispatched officers to check it out. 16 minutes later at 7.43 p.m., the sheriff's department gets another call about this black sedan up against the snowbank, and it came in from a local school bus driver. The driver said he was going down the road and he sees this black sedan up against the side of the road and what appeared to be the driver, this young woman, no one was helping her. So the school bus driver pulls over and walks up to her. She says her name is Maura Murray. She's 21 years old. She's a college student in Massachusetts. She seemed totally fine, but was adamant that he did not call the police. And so the school bus driver at the time didn't call the police. He kind of sized her up as seeming like she was okay. She said she was going to call for a tow truck. And so he left thinking she was going to be just fine. But only a couple of minutes after leaving the scene, he felt like, you know what, I got to call the police because something just seemed off. The sheriff tells him that they had already gotten a call about 20 minutes earlier and that officers would be there any minute. And I'm sure she's just fine. Three minutes later, the officer who was originally dispatched to check out this black sedan shows up and radios in and says, the black sedan is here, but there's no girl, there's no driver. Police do an initial search of the area. They can't find Mora. There's no sign of where she would have gone. There's no sign of a struggle. They get in touch with Mora's family. They can't get in touch with Mora. And so it's like she just kind of vanished. And so that night they labeled Mora officially a missing person. On February 8th, the day before Mora went missing, she was with her father. They went out to eat and he would say to police that she seemed totally normal. There was no red flags. There was no clear stressors in her life. Everything just seemed normal. The next morning when she gets up on February 9th, this is the day she goes missing, she finds out that all of her classes that day have been canceled because of a snowstorm. She gets up, goes over to her computer and emails all of her professors as well as her work supervisor and tells them that there's been a death in her family and she needs to take the next week off. Family members would say that there was no death in the family, that that was a lie. After emailing her professors, she drives to an ATM, withdraws $280, and then goes to a liquor store and buys $40 worth of alcohol. She also stopped at the Amherst DMV to get some paperwork she needed for some damage that had been done to her car. After that, we don't really know what she was doing until she wound up on that snowbank in Woodsville, New Hampshire. When police searched her abandoned car, they found printed out directions to a condo complex in Burlington, Vermont. Cell phone records show Mora had placed a call to one of the owners of a condo that had been put up for rent, but Mora had not indicated to anyone in her life that she was looking to rent a condo in Burlington, Vermont. Nor had she indicated to anyone that she might be traveling to Vermont for any reason. When they searched her dorm room, all of her belongings had been packed and her room had been meticulously cleaned. It was clear that she was getting ready to leave her dorm, but this is mid-semester. There's no reason she'd be leaving prematurely. And on top of her belongings in her dorm room was this typed up note to her boyfriend detailing all of their relationship issues. It wasn't a breakup note, but it was definitely something close to that. Most of Mora's belongings were either in her dorm room, all packed up, or in her abandoned car. But her cell phone, debit cards, and credit cards were all missing. However, they were never used again after the day she went missing, February 9th. Six days after Mora went missing, a massive search is conducted around her abandoned car. They covered 20 square miles. They had helicopters. They had scent sniffing dogs. They had hundreds of people on the ground, and there was just no trace of her. But even more strangely, on the night Mora went missing, there was snow on the ground. So you'd think you'd be able to find a couple footprints showing you where Mora might have gone. But there was none, and the scent-sniffing dogs could only track her scent about 100 feet away from the car before they lost the scent. It was like she vanished into thin air. So something happened to Maura Murray between 7.46 p.m. when the bus driver left the scene and called the police. He said she was there, he saw her, and 7.49 p.m. when the officer who was dispatched arrived on scene and Maura's not there. She went somewhere, we just don't know where or why or with who. And unfortunately, to this day, this case remains unsolved. Here is the final picture of Maura Murray. This is her withdrawing $280 at that ATM shortly before she hopped back in her car, drove up to Woodsville, New Hampshire, crashed on the side of the road, and then disappeared.
Armin Mibus seemed like a really good guy. He mowed his neighbor's lawn, he offered to fix his friend's cars, he would host these great dinner parties at his house. But underneath that charming outer layer, Armin Mibus was a deeply disturbed individual. In 2001, Armin would place an ad on the internet seeking a young, well-built man that is looking to be slaughtered and then consumed. Mibus actually got a lot of replies to this and people acted like they were interested, but I think people were just responding because it was such an outrageous thing he was asking for, so no one went through with it. Until a man named Bernard Brandis saw it, who had previously placed an ad on the internet himself asking if there was anybody out there that would slaughter and eat him. So perfect match. So Brandis reaches out to Armin and says, yes, I'd love to. And on March 9th, 2001, the two meet up at Armin's house. Brandis lays down in the bathtub while Armin sets up a video camera. He wants to film this for a variety of reasons, but mostly he wants to make sure that everybody sees that Brandis is doing this willingly. On camera, Brandis gives Armin the go-ahead. Initially, Armin tries biting into Brandis, but apparently he was too chewy, so Brandis suggests he gets a knife. After successfully removing a piece of Brandis, Armin fries it up in a pan, and the two of them begin to eat it. But apparently it was too burned to either of their liking, and they would feed that piece of him to the dog. At this point, Brandis is in and out of consciousness because he's losing a lot of blood, so Armin decides to take a break and go to his room and read a Star Trek book. When Armin goes back in the bathroom, it's clear that Brandis is still alive, but he's on the verge of death. So after much deliberation and quite a bit of praying, Armin ultimately ends Brandis' life and then proceeds to butcher him and put all of his meat into a freezer. Over the next 10 months, Armin would consume over 44 pounds of Brandis. In December of 2001, Armin put another ad online seeking somebody else that wanted to be eaten, and that ad would get sent to the police who would go to Armin's house. They would find Brandis' remains behind pizza boxes in the back of his freezer, and they would arrest Armin. Despite showing police the videotape that showed Brandis repeatedly consenting to what was happening to him, Armin was still given a life sentence. This is the picture that Brandis put online in hopes that it would attract someone that would want to eat him. And this is the bathtub where Armin Mivis would grant Brandis that wish. A disaster began to quietly unfold at 8.49 a.m. on April 16th, 2014. The Seawall Ferry that was on a routine trip to Jeju Island in South Korea was beginning to lean very badly to one side. The ferry had recently undergone illegal renovations, adding a whole bunch of new rooms to the top of the ferry that made it much more profitable, but dangerously top-heavy. Corrupt regulators who were bought off with fancy dinners and travel allowed the ship to sail unsafe despite never having stepped foot on board. Had they gone on the ship themselves, they would have seen immediately how unsafe it was. On April 16th, the day this ferry is making its way to Jeju Island and is now leaning to one side, ferry workers had loaded twice the legal limit onto the ferry and then hadn't properly secured really any of it. So there were cars and shipping containers that were not tethered. So as the badly balanced seawall ferry is making its way out to Jeju Island, it hits some very strong currents and makes a sharp turn to avoid them causing the ship to begin to keel over. As soon as it begins to keel over, all those unsecured cars and containers all shift all at once to one side of the ship, causing it to completely roll over on its side and begin sinking. On board were 476 passengers, of which 325 were high school students on a school trip. As soon as the ship comes to rest on its side, the captain comes over the intercom and tells everybody to stay in your rooms and await further instruction. And everybody listens, they all stay in their room. And honestly, you can't blame them because they're on a routine ferry trip that happens dozens of times a day without any incident. And the captain of the ship is telling you, everything's fine, you just stay where you are, we'll tell you what to do next. After a little while, a lot of the students start to feel a little bit anxious because there's been no further instruction, they're still sideways, and they're starting to realize that if they needed to, it would be hard to get out of the ship. A lot of them were way into the bowels of the ship and they would literally need to climb up and out of the ship to safety. A student actually called the authorities and said, hey, I think the ship I'm on is sinking and the authorities hadn't heard of it. 
because the captain and the crew of the ship were just totally crippled and could not make a decision and had wasted all this time that they could have been evacuating people and getting help and instead were just panicked and frozen in terror. There would be over 20 calls from students pleading with authorities to come save them because now they know the ship is sinking because they can hear the sound of water rushing into the ship and it's just a matter of time before it reaches them. Finally, almost an hour after the ship had originally keeled over onto its side, the captain issues the evacuation call to the whole ship. But at this point, water's already getting into the compartments where these students have been told to stay. And students aren't able to leave, and there's this panic to get out of the ship. So the evacuation order was doing nothing. It was already too late. One person who survived, who had left early and disobeyed the stay-in-your-room order, they had climbed to the top of the ship, which was really the side of the ship, and they were looking down into the ship through a hallway and they said there was this mass of people that were coming out of their rooms and trying to climb up this hallway right as a rush of water poured in through the side of this hallway and completely filled it and they were gone. Later on, when divers would go down to recover the bodies, they would find that many of the students had broken fingers from desperately trying to climb up those hallways when water was pouring in on them. After the divers recovered the bodies, investigators began going through their cell phones to get some sense of what happened. And on their phones were these tragic pictures and videos of these students staying in their rooms like they were told to do, just waiting for their captain to give them further instruction that never came. The captain actually abandoned ship right after that 9.30 call to evacuate came when hundreds of students were still down below. He left the ship. So they were totally on their own, just waiting for help that never came. Of the 476 passengers, 304 would perish, and many believe that almost all of them could have been saved had they just evacuated as soon as the ship keeled over. And so as a result of his gross negligence, the captain was given a life sentence. Following World War II, the Soviet Union began investing heavily into nuclear power. And by 1977, the V.I. Lenin nuclear power station located in Chernobyl, Ukraine was finally operational. The station itself was comprised of four reactors that were each labeled 1, 2, 3, and 4. On April 25th, 1986, a group of very sleep-deprived plant workers began running a series of routine tests on nuclear reactor number 4. They were trying to see if the reactor could still be cooled even in the event of a complete power loss. But during the test, perhaps because they were sleep-deprived and just didn't feel like doing it, they started cutting corners and violated a number of safety protocols that led to several surges of power inside of the reactor. This led to a chain reaction of explosions within reactor number four that culminated in a massive explosion that blew the lid off the building, exposing the reactor's core. It would take the Soviets 10 days to finally stop the fire that was raging inside of this exposed core, which meant for those 10 days, radiation on an unprecedented level was spewed into the environment by this fire. But even after the fire was controlled, you have all this radioactive material that needs to be properly disposed of. And so the Soviets started by using robots to go up and pick up these materials and dispose of them, but the robots were breaking down from the high levels of radiation. And so naturally the Soviets sent in groups of men to go pick up the material and dozens of people died from radiation sickness. A few months after the explosion, the first steel sarcophagus was built around reactor number four to try to contain some of that radiation. But even with that protection, it's estimated that the area around Chernobyl will not be habitable for another 20,000 years. So as a result, the Soviet Union created what they call an exclusion zone, which is 19 miles all around Chernobyl that no one can go inside of. And so nature's kind of reclaimed this area that used to be a fairly bustling metropolis. One year after the disaster, Ukrainian containment crews finally broke into the steam corridor that was located underneath the molten remains of reactor number four. And as soon as they stepped in, their radiation readers spiked all the way to the top. And so they know that whatever's at the the other end of this L-shaped hallway is something they did not want to get close to. And so they put a camera on a chair with wheels and they pushed it down the hall to where
where it finally broke that corner and had a clear line of sight to the other end. And using a timer on the camera, they were able to take a picture of one of the single most dangerous things in the entire world. It became known as the elephant's foot. It was a molten pile of nuclear fuel and melted metal and sand and concrete that had all kind of converged and seeped through a pipe meant for steam and found its way into the basement. It was and still is emitting the equivalent level of radiation of four and a half million chest x-rays every hour. Today, if you were to stand in front of the elephant's foot without proper equipment for 30 seconds, your cells would start to hemorrhage and you would become viciously ill and you could even die. At two minutes of exposure, you're definitely going to die, but not right away. You have 48 hours and there's nothing you can do to stop it. You are 100% going to die. On October 31st, 2013, four mechanics were performing routine maintenance on a wind turbine in the Netherlands. In the early afternoon, all four of them are standing on top of the turbine itself, two on one end and two on the other, and a small fire breaks out inside of the housing of the turbine, right near where you would go back into the housing. Now, it's unclear what caused the fire, but it's speculated that it was caused by a short circuit. The two engineers on this side of the turbine were able to jump over the fire, land in the stairwell, and run their way down to safety. The other two on this side had a bad angle and could not make the jump, and so they had to wait until rescue workers showed up to put the fire out. But wind turbines are usually in areas that are very far away from society because they're huge and they're kind of eyesores. And so the response time was not good. The fire department did not show up very quickly. And by the time they got to the wind turbine, that little fire had gotten much, much bigger and had creeped up onto the platform that they are on. And then when the fire department actually started performing their job, the fire had spread well down the stairwell. And so it was very difficult and took a very long time to make their way up using the stairs. And the crane on the truck itself did not extend high enough to reach them either. The two trapped mechanics are watching this in real time. They're looking down and they can see the fire department is not going to be able to reach us in time because the fire is now spreading and getting bigger and bigger and they're being pushed to the very edge of this wind turbine with an 80 meter fall to the ground. As the fire inched closer and closer and closer to them, the men must have realized that they have to make a decision here. They can either sit here and wait and hope for some miracle that perhaps a helicopter shows up and scoops them up or some other mechanism of rescue is able to occur or they try to make a run for it through the flames on the top of the turbine into the stairwell and just hope that the fire in the stairwell is not as severe and that maybe they can run through it and make it out the other side. Or the final option is to jump off the side and hope you survive the fall. And so as the fire continued to grow and get closer and closer to them, the men embrace one last time, and then one of them makes a run for it through the flames into the stairwell. His charred body would be found right at the landing of the stairs. He did not make it very far. He really had no hope. The last remaining mechanic is standing there wondering what he should do. He's probably looking down in hopes that he's going to see his friend who just ran in there emerge at the bottom on the ground safe but he doesn't. And after a considerable amount of time and the fire is getting closer and closer, he knows his friend didn't make it and probably not wanting to suffer the fate that his friend did, he jumps. This is the picture of the two mechanics embracing for that final time. I'm sure at the time of this picture, they were aware that almost certainly they were not going to get out of this alive. They were 19 and 21. In 2013, Philip Chisholm was a 14-year-old high school student going to school in Danvers, Massachusetts. He lived at home with his single mother. 
Classmates described Chisholm as being quiet, a bit of a loner. He was a great student, and he was the leading scorer of his soccer team. On October 22nd, 2013, Chisholm missed soccer practice in the afternoon and then missed a team dinner that night, at which point his teammates tried calling and texting him. He didn't get back to them, so they got in touch with his mother. She tried reaching out to him to no avail, and so she contacted the police and said, my son is missing. On the same night that Chisholm is reported missing, one of his teachers, 24-year-old old Colleen Ritzer doesn't come home from work. Her family and her friends try reaching out to her, texting her, calling her, no response. So they too go to the police and they report her missing as well. The police were already looking for Chisholm. So when they hear one of his teachers is also missing, they assume they must be linked. And so they go to the high school, even though it's well after hours, to see if maybe there's some clues there. They search the high school and Chisholm is not there and neither is Miss Ritzer. But when they're looking in the girls' restroom that was right next to Miss Ritzer's classroom, they find a small splash of blood. Even though at the time they had no way of knowing if this blood was connected to Chisholm or Miss Ritzer, they decided they would pull all the security footage for the past 24 hours that was looking in the direction of this bathroom. And they make a startling discovery starting at the 2.54 p.m. mark on October 22nd, the day they went missing. This is Miss Ritzer walking down the hall towards the bathroom that had blood in it. This is Chisholm following Miss Ritzer into the hall. He's looking hesitant. He doesn't really know what he's gonna do. He's thinking about following her. And at some point he says, you know what? I am gonna do this. He goes back into the classroom, reemerges with his hood on and walks down the hall towards the bathroom where Miss Ritzer is. This is Chisholm entering the girl's bathroom with surgical gloves on. 11 minutes later, Chisholm would leave the bathroom. Miss Ritzer would still be inside. Chisholm would leave school property, he would run outside, he would get a big recycling bin, and then he would wheel that back into the school, and then he would go back into the bathroom with the recycling bin. At 3.21 p.m., 26 minutes after Chisholm had first entered the girls' bathroom after Miss Ritzer, he re-emerges, now wearing a full face mask, he doesn't have a sweatshirt on anymore, and he's pulling along this recycling bin that looks noticeably heavier than when he brought it in. And that's because Miss Ritzer's body is now stuffed inside of it. Police were able to locate Miss Ritzer's body using the surveillance cameras on the outside of the school. They just watched what he did with the recycling bin and he didn't bring it very far away from the school. Police were able to quickly track Chisholm down and arrest him because as soon as he was done attacking Miss Ritzer, he used her credit card to go to a movie theater in town and watched a movie. So he's on security cameras watching the movie and the police were tracking her credit cards because they noticed they were stolen and they saw that he had swiped the card at this movie theater. So he gets arrested and he's given a life sentence. Here's the footage of Chisholm leaving the girl's bathroom with Miss Ritzer's body inside of that recycling bin. His motives remain unclear, but he claims she used what he called a trigger word that really upset him. So that's gonna do it guys. I hope you enjoyed today's stories. Let me know in the comments what you thought and I will pin the best comment at the top of the comment section. If you haven't done this already, please offer the like button a flimsy plastic outdoor chair. And as soon as they sit down, kick one of the legs out from under them. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly updates.